Hello, good morning everybody and welcome to this morning's webinar on packaging machine safety, understanding EN415 series of standards. My name is Jason Reed. I'm one of the account managers at PILTS and I'll be your presenter today. Um, please let me know if you can hear me or, or not, more importantly. Um, you can type your questions using the toolbar on the right hand side of your screen, which you should see, and my colleagues Mark Staples and it's actually Alex Bryce today will be answering your questions during the webinar. If they can't answer them uh, during the webinar, then um, we'll get back to you shortly afterwards. You'll automatically receive a link to the recording of this webinar as well a few hours after it's uh, completed. And you should also see additional handouts um, on the right hand side as well as the presentation itself. So the agenda for today will be to discuss the different types of packaging machines on the market, um, presumption of conformity to the standards of the Machinery Safety uh, Re uh, Regulations 2008, which was the Machinery Directive, and using the uh, designated standards. An overview of the three types of standards Type A, and there's only one of these, which is uh, 12100, uh, risk assessments and risk reduction principles, and I'll give an overview of available safeguarding technologies from PILTS. Type B standards, that's technical safety measures and aspects, and again I'll give an overview of the most commonly used for packaging machines. Then we'll get into the main body of the webinar with Type C standards, and in this case EN415 parts 1 to 10, as it's a 10-part standard. And then finally, there'll be a conclusion. So packaging machine characteristics. Packaging machines um, focus on high speed and or maximum production time. Therefore, downtime, including when it's related to safety issues, are very damaging to profitability. Packaging machine manufacturers should ensure that machines are running to maximum productivity by introducing levels of safety, which ensure that operators cannot come into harm. Packaging machines are typically very fast moving and safety components can be uh, as much about protecting uh, the expensive machinery as well as protecting operators. Um, but the operators and people will, uh, will always come first. Types of, uh, of packaging machines. So typically we have three zones, primary, secondary, and finally palletizing. So for primary, we may have a product being prepared it could be uh, soft drinks uh, or, or toothpaste that is placed directly in the container or the tube. If you look at food, uh, beverage, pharmaceuticals or beauty products as an example, hygiene considerations need to be taken into account at the primary stage as the product is in direct contact with the packaging. However, um, we won't be looking at this um, as this is typically down to the end user. Primary packaging is then closed, and this could be by capping or sealing, before moving on to secondary packaging, which might be grouping the products into uh, different quantities, uh, so say four or eight for the soft drink cans. And this is what you would then typically see at the, at the shops or the supermarket. Less plastics are being used in primary to secondary packaging uh, today due to environmental issues and recycling. And this is evident with multi drinks cans. Um, and then move to securing them from plastic to, uh, to cardboard. The individually grouped products then need to be prepared for secondary packs for shipments. Uh, with the soft drinks, again, uh, stacking them onto a pallet before you can load them onto a truck. You would need to secure them, and this could be over uh, wrapping with cellophane or strapping. And then the pallets can be stored or sent for distribution. Um, so as mentioned earlier, with primary filling machines, and some examples here, typically they're made um, out of stainless steel due to, uh, to the washdown um, that's required and the hygiene requirements. Secondary machine examples, uh, and again, we'll go into detail of these, but you've got uh, grouping machines, cartoning um, machines, you've got uh, strapping machines of less than 400 millimetres, We've got shrink wrappers, robot palletizers uh, for palletizing machines, pallet shrink wrapping machines, um, so moving conveyors, cling film wrapping, uh, banders. 
but we also need to take into account uh, continuous handling equipment uh, between each zone section of the process and there's a separate standard for these uh, which we won't cover in this webinar but need to be taken into account integrated lines if you're creating packaging line either as an OEM or the end user then you may have a complex assembly and a UKCA mark may be required for the whole line not individual machines in the UK, the supply of machinery safety regulations applies to assembly of machines as well as to individually completed machines where they are assembled together to carry out a common function. The constituent, uh, constituent parts are functionally linked in such a way that each unit affects the operation of the other units and the constituent part, uh, units have a common control system. A group of machines that are connected to each other but where each machine functions independently of the others is not considered to be an assembly of machines uh, in the above sense and so would not require a UKCA mark. So standards provide a presumption of conformity to the essential health and safety requirements of the supply machinery safety regulations. Compliance with a standard is not mandatory so it's not it's not the law that you have to follow the standard but compliance with the applicable essential health and safety requirements of the supply of machinery safety regulations is that is a legal requirement um, and current applicable standards provide the best practice and state-of-the-art principles so they're a far more convenient way a method uh, uh, a method really of demonstrating compliance as opposed to creating uh, your own route to that and use of harmonized and designated standards provide automatic presumption of conformity with the relevant essential health and safety requirements of the regulations and a list of all harmonized standards designated standards uh, can be found on the uh, the gov.uk website standards are structured um, and are shown in the uh, in the triangle Type A standards embrace all types of machinery covering general safety design principles, risk assessment and risk reduction to EN 12100. Type B1 deal with particular safety aspects and that could be uh, safety related controls, so 3849. Type B2 cover specific protection devices. Uh, so in that case it could be uh, 14119 for interlocks. C-type standards provide detailed requirements for specific machinery. In this case, EN415 for packaging machines, with reference to A and B standards. And the further down the pyramid you go from A to C, the more standards there are, there are hundreds of C-type standards. And if a C-type standard exists and it's applicable to your machine, then it shall be applied first and take precedent over the A and B types as they are referenced in the C standard. However, always check A and B standards are current, and if not, use the replacement standard. C type standards take far longer to update compared to A and B standards. So the C type standard may reference, for example, EN uh, 954 part one, which is now withdrawn and replaced by 13849. And we would recommend using the latest A and B standards as best practice and state of the art. And you'll see this, uh, out of date standards um, throughout the, the webinar today um, because a lot of 415 is is old. So the A standard is 12100 um, and if we just focus on XB there are lots of examples and pictures of hazards, hazardous situations and hazardous events that you can use to check to see if present on your machine um, or not. And these could include mechanical, so it could be moving parts, uh, electrical, so maybe 240 volts uh, with non uh, IP rated uh, terminals, it could be thermal, um, and this could be for, uh, for sealing packages, noise, vibration, radiation, uh, material and substance, and primary packing, this could be dependent on how we wash the machine down, say after any spillages, Hazard situations are the various phases or stages when people come into contact with the machine during its life cycle. So 
We include uh, transport, assembly and installation, commissioning, setting, teaching, programming. Uh, we look at process changeover, the, oper uh, the operation, the cleaning, the maintenance. Um, so all of these really are task-based uh, risks. Hazard events are looking at contact with moving parts. So this could be uh, falling, ejection, loss of stability, um, breakup. So for primary packaging, as an example, if you were filling a glass bottle under pressure uh, and the filling process isn't controlled, then you could damage the, um, the bottle and get glass and shrapnel everywhere. Um, and this is obviously going to cause a huge problem uh, with cleaning, etc. Um, you've got electric arc, uncontrolled movements, uh, emissions from hazardous situations, repetitive handling at high frequency. Um, and I would have liked to have shown examples of this uh, from 12100, uh, but copyright prevents me from, from really doing this. So EN 12100 is very generic and is applicable to any machine and is a requirement to, do, uh, to conduct a risk assessment of this type on all equipment, whether the OEM or the end user. So to conduct a, the, the risk assessment, we start, the starting procedure um, is to look at the limits of the machine, how big is it? Where is it being positioned? Uh, what speed is it operating at? What material is being used? Um, and within the and within the uh, limits, hazards need to be identified. So we estimate the level of risk, and once this is done, evaluate the level of risk. Is it then tolerable, or does it need reducing? And if it's not adequately reduced, then a three-step method is used, starting with inherently safe design measures. So protective measures which either eliminates hazards or reduces the risk associated with the hazards by changing the design or operating characteristics of the machine without the use of guards or protective measures. We then have uh, safeguarding. So that's protective measures using safeguards to protect persons from hazards which cannot reasonably uh, be eliminated or su sufficiently reduced by inherently safe design measures. So that for there, we look at guarding, interlocks, light curtains, etc. And we'll touch at these uh, throughout the, uh, the webinar. And then finally, we have information for use. That's protective measures consisting of uh, communication links, really. Um, so signs, uh, signals, symbols, warning devices and safe operating procedures. If protective measures are dependent on control systems, then either 38849 or 62061 should be used for functional safety. And then it's a loop to see if other hazards have been generated by the protective measures and has the reduced been adequately uh, reduced. So safeguarding complementary technologies on the machine, uh, you can see on this page, uh, and yes, they're all in yellow, and you guessed it from uh, from fields. Uh, so I'm not going to run through all of these, uh, just the majority of them. Um, but you have the PZEN code, which is a RFID coded switch to monitor uh, the guard position, so whether it's open or closed. We have the PZEN M lock, which is used for guard locking. So if the machine has a rundown time, or you don't want to interrupt product cycle, then you would request to enter. And when it's safe to do so, i.e. when the machine has come to a standstill or the production cycle has stopped, the solenoid is energised on the M-lock, allowing the guard to, uh, to be opened. The PCN uh, M-lock, which you can see here, uh, is also a popular product on packaging machines, as uh, it's used to hold guards closed until a process is completed. So it it isn't being used as a safety interlock, it's being used to protect the process. Then there's an RFID code inside the unit to determine if the guard is open or, uh, or, or closed. And if it's opened, it would then prevent the machine from being restarted. We then have devices such as the PCN radar, the scan and the OP2 light curtains. And these are typically used where there's no physical guards, but you need to detect if somebody is either approaching or in the danger area. These are typically used at the, uh, the in and the out feed of, uh, of palletizers or wrappers. And then we have complementary measures such as e-stops and mode selection um, plus RFID keys um, for, um, again, for safe mode operation.
some packaging machines and various guards, flaps or covers, which may have been opened, say to clean a uh, blockage or, uh, or, or, or to clean uh, the machine. But these need to be closed during operation and to start. But there can be so many, it's useful to have a switch on them so that you can determine which cover is opened or which switch has failed. But you don't want to wire them individually back to a panel because of the costs uh, or the distance, but you want to connect them in series across the machine without fault masking. So to do this, we use transistor devices with OSSDs, so output signal switching devices, which can be connected in series, which are then integrated to our safety device diagnostics unit and a field bus gateway connected to the upstream machine PLC. And this would then tell you which guard or cover was opened. And so not only does it reduce overall wiring, but more importantly, machine downtime, you're not having to go around and check each door or flap or cover um, you'd actually see that on your, your HMI, for instance. We have various safety relays, both programmable and non-programmable, uh, safety PLCs with remote o, uh, IO and connectivity protocols. And finally, uh, for PILS product sales, we have decentralized units that are used more and more within packaging machines and lines for fail-safe IO. Uh, all your nodes, switches, etc., are daisy-chained. Um, to the PDP uh, decentralized modules. And then the last PDP is connected to the main logic solver in the panel. And again, this gives you lo localized diagnostics for machine uptime at the node and reduces the machine cabling and downtime. Excuse me. So an example here is a, a pallet wrapper. Uh, pallet wrapping machine which would fall under EN415 part 6 with a number of previously discussed products on it and uh, an unwrapped, papet, uh, unwrapped pallet with packed products on it will make its way to the start of the pallet wrapper via an in-feed conveyor. At the entrance we have a set of light curtains and muting sensors which have been set up to determine if it's a pallet heading towards the light curtain. If it is then the light curtain will be temporarily muted and the muting lamp above the light curtain will illuminate to warn personnel the light curtain is muted. If it was a person to go along the conveyor for any reason, then they wouldn't break the muting sensor correctly, and the light curtain would still be active and stop the machine. Light curtains are typically used at the in and out feed of the wrapping machine. We then have an interlock guard on the side of the machine, which might be for operators or maintenance personnel to set the machine up or carry out fault finding, um, but the guard needs to be closed to run the machine. However, it may be necessary to run the machine at low speeds with the guard open, so certain operations can be conducted, and this may be done via a two-hand control, which prevents them coming into contact with any moving parts and to keep the oper operator away from the, from the hazard. And you only want authorized and trained personnel to carry this task out, um, and to do this, you can use RFID keys, uh, and in this case, our PIP mode uh, reader. And um, so if you don't have the correct RFID, RFID key, you wouldn't be able to carry out the task. So most common B standards. Uh, I'm not going to run through, through all of these. And again, you, you've, you'll get a copy um, of the presentation, so you can have a look at these. Uh, but these are pretty much the most the most common. If I just pick a pick a few, um, we have 14118, which is prevention of unexpected startups. Uh, 14119 for interlocking devices associated with guards. Um, we've got 13849 parts one and two, safety related parts of the control system, and that's design, validation, and uh, and verification. Uh, 31851 two under control devices. And then we go down to 60204 electrical equipment machines. So these are all these are all relevant. The C standards for packaging machines are listed here and go from part one to part ten. And all have various dates of release. Part one is terminology and classification to determine what type of packaging machine you have and identify which of the following parts of the standard apply. And these are Parts two for preformed rigid container packaging machines, part three, form, fill, and seal machines, 
part four, palletizer and deep palletizer, part five, wrapping machines, part six, pallet wrapping machines, part seven, group and secondary packaging machines, part eight, strapping machines, part nine is noise measurement methods for packaging machines, and part nine is not for any particular packaging machine, um, but covers all, and part 10 is general requirements, and is used to supplement all other parts of the standard where new methods of automation or robots, for example, are used, and fills some of the gaps that are existing in other parts. So for example, part two and part four of 415 were both released in, late, in the late 1990s, so are old, and are not harmonized or designated to either the machinery directive or annex one of the supply of machinery safety regulations. However, it's recommended that they're still used where relevant. I'll run through the structure of a standard and then we'll go into 415 in more detail. The main sections are all normative, meaning that they are prescriptive um, and have to be followed in order to comply. You can't just pick and choose. So we have section one, which is the scope, section two, normative references. And so this is where other standards could apply. Section three, terms and uh, definitions, uh, not conditions. Uh, section four, list of hazards. So you still need to conduct your own risk assessment. And that's quite important. Section five, safety requirements and measures. So what you need to do to reduce the risk. Section six, verification of safety requirements and measures and section seven which is information for use after the main sections of the annexes and these are generally informative meaning that the that they are descriptive to help the reader to understand concepts described in the normative parts so 415 part one this section of the standard lists every type of packaging machine and machinery alphabetically and gives a short description along with, in, uh, with informing you what part of the standard applies to it. So screw capping machines, the definition reference is 3.2.2.1 which reads closing machine which applies a threaded cap or lid usually to a rigid container and the standard is 415 part 2. You don't need to have 415 part 1 if you already know what packaging machine you have. 415 part two, preformed rigid container uh, packaging machines. And these include bottles, cans, cups, jars, kegs, casks, and barrels, um, and may be made from glass, metal, plastics, or composite, uh, composite, composite materials. The containers are not normally manufactured by the machine, but they could be, and can be sealed by seamed end, cap, cork, a foil lid, or similar. And the machines pack liquid, creams, pastes, powders in preformed rigid containers, and they can also sort, invert, clean, inspect, pressurize, sterilize, and label these containers. Uh, the standard is not listed on the, uh, the gov.uk website, um, so it's not designated to the supply of machinery safety regulations or harmonised the machinery directive. It refers to A and B standards that are now superseded, however it is still better than nothing, so you can justify your compliance with the uh, EHSRs but you need to double check against the EHR, EHSRs within the regulations to ensure that they are adequately dealt with. And where standards have been superseded, it's recommended that the latest state-of-the-art standard is applied. So an example of that is what was discussed earlier, 954 has been replaced by 13849. Common hazards include uh, mechanical, thermal, electric, etc. And importantly, hazards caused by faults in the control system. Specific uh, machine hazards are also identified for rinses, capping, machine, uh, capping machine, thermal heat sealers, labeling and coding machines, it then specifies both common safety requirements and the machine specific safety requirements in great detail. In doing so, we'll cross-reference all appropriate standards from where they have been derived. 
but above all and first and foremost it specifies that a formal risk assessment must be carried out on the machine. Section 4 of this standard identifies significant hazards during filling and cleaning such as crushing or stabbing for mechanical, uh, electrocu electrocution or fire for electrical and then down to combinations hazards which uh, in this case could be pressurised hot liquid uh, like the example used earlier and if not controlled adequately then the glass bottle could shatter. Section 5 identifies examples of protection from these hazards by using machine specific type examples. And so for guards, these could be fixed guards and or interlock guards with guard locking and appro appropriately designed and positioned tunnel guards on the infeed and the outfeeds. And that would be 850 millimeter for full arm or if it was uh, waist height, then 500 millimeter. And with light curtains, uh, light curtains or light beams um, using uh, EN 13855 to determine their correct um, and safe positioning. And the next webinar from PILDS will actually cover this, this subject. We're going to cover um, this in uh, 405 part four and six, as, it's, as it mentions 954. But I've left it within the webinar for if you download the slides it's then relevant to that part of the, of the standard uh, and the same for this slide too. Other points to consider inspection points for viewing critical parts of the machine, depressurized systems prior to access uh, by using guard locking so the guard cannot be opened until the pressure is at a safe level. The machine may also require extraction or ventilation systems if any toxic fumes are generated. You might have to take uh, you might take legionnaires into account um, if recirculating water and the mutant of light curtains, which we'll go into in a bit more detail later. Four and five part three form fill and ceiling machines, of which there are many different types. So uh, you've got flow wrapping machines, you've got vertical form fill and sealing machines, which you typically uh, see and are used in the snacks industry for, for sealing your bags of crisps. Uh, you've got pre-made bag erect fill and close machines, uh, horizontal end load uh, cartoner, uh, you've got uh, volumetric cup fillers, uh, graphimetric fillers, and section four details specific hazards for the above types of machines such as being clamped or burned uh, by the hot jaws of the ceiling mechanism on the uh, on the vertical form fill and seal machine. So, you know, these are quite very dangerous machines. Um, 415 part four, palletizers and depalletizers. Uh, so we've got uh, box carton palletizer, robot palletizers, um, bottle um, depalletizer, these applications. 415 again is not harmonised or designated um, but still represents best practice. It mentions types of loading for pallets and depalletizer applications, identifies zones, so boundaries of the machine and safeguards along with the operator area. Common hazards are also identified such as mechanical, impact, electrical, ejection. It also specifies common safety requirements for the above types of machine and cross references with appropriate standards and again it specifies that a formal risk assessment must be carried out on the machine. There are specific guidance on the UK uh, HSE website dealing with palletizers as these can be very dangerous. Most injuries occur when operators or maintenance personnel enter the machine and become trapped between the fixed parts and the moving parts um, such as transfer heads, sweepers, pushers, uh, etc. And the risk is made greater by the unexpected nature of machine movement. And there are also hazards from falling loads, sudden, sudden movements or jammed products, or pallets that are uh, freed or by movement due to failure to dump stored energy in pneumatic and hydraulic systems. Section 5 starts by saying that not all hazards are identified in 415 Part 4, so a risk assessment must be carried out. It then identifies examples of protection from these hazards, giving machine-specific examples. 
uh, fixed guards and perimeter guards with interlocking and guard locking functions to control access. It's date CN 294, which is now replaced by 13857. Light curtains or light beams to determine safe and correct positioning, and the interlocks, light curtains, e-stops, etc., should be connected to an appropriately designed safety-related control system to EN 594 Part 1. However, as discussed earlier, this is now withdrawn, um, so should be um, used by uh, so should be determined, sorry, by using 3849. And the performance light uh, level is likely to be between PLC to PLE. You sometimes have suspended loads on palletizers, and if there is an energy loss, this could create a gravity fall. So a restraint should be used, which are automatic and be effective up to the full load. It can be done by mechanical or hydraulic locking, by braking or by anti-fall devices such as pulls, which lock a pallet or a layer transfer li uh, lift platform. It's advised that teaching should be done from outside the interior zone. So don't be inside the guard teaching the machine, even if you're experienced and know the hazards, as generally the movement will be very fast, quite sudden and inescapable. Here we have examples of cross beam muting for the in and out feed, uh, where the direction of travel is always the same. The guidance can be found in 604. 62046 and it should be pointed out that the cross point should be in the danger non-safe zone and not in line with the light curtain. Sorry part five is wrapping machines and we have examples here of continuous low wrappers, high speed wrappers, tray wrappers with heat, uh, heat shrink, uh, shrink tunnel and horizontal wrappers. In general, it's important to point out that uh, part five only covers wrapping machines designed to handle products less than 400 millimeters. Anything above this is covered by part six, which is pallet wrapping machines. And we have examples here of uh, stretch wrapper, rotary wrapper, inline rotary wrapper, uh, hood wrapper, these are all used to stable a load before being placed into racking or dispatched. The standard is relatively new and lists a number of machines. We've got uh, pallet banding, stretch film pallet wrapping machines, stretch film hood application uh, machines, mobile stretch film wrapping machines, semi-automatic, uh, shrink film pallet wrapping machines, film removal uh, machines, sleeve wrapping machines. And these are for all products greater than 400 millimeter. Um, it also states that before um, this standard is used, a formal risk assessment must be carried out. Common hazards that are identified are listed here, with entanglement and drawing in being the most common uh, but would depend on the nature of the pallet wrapper. And these are serious hazards that you don't want to come in uh, contact with. Specific hazards are then listed in sections relating to the part of the pallet wrapping machine. If we look to 4.3.2, the standard will look at the rotary table, the film reel assembly, film clamp, the hold down device, conveyor, and the top sheet feeder in, uh, in detail. 4.4.2, hazards common to most shrinking systems, will look at thermal hazards, gas heating elements, hazards associated with the materials and other substances and hazards generated by noise. There are then some specifics on safeguarding. 5.2.2.1.3, fixed and interlock guards. Where opened top distance guards are used, they shall be safeguarded by fixed or interlocked guards complying with EN 953, which is now 14120, and be at least 2,000 millimetres high from the floor. 5.2.2.1.5, presence in the danger zone, where it is not possible to see the interior of the machine from the control panel, provisions of closed circuit television or use of trap key systems is suggested. A means of resetting light curtain shall be out of reach from within the danger zone. 
So if it's full body access, I'd recommend a trap key system over CCTV that somebody needs to be constantly watching the CCTV um, as opposed to the operator having the personnel key um, on them from the trap key system, which would then prevent the machine from being restarted. 5.2.2.1.7 stopping time. Stopping time for these machine, uh, these types of machines should be less than one second after the opening of an interlocked guard. Consider the use of an electromechanical braking system or appropriate variable speed drive. If it is not one second, then the guard needs to be moved further away from the hazard or use guard locking, which prevents the door from being opened till it's at a standstill. And 5.2.3.1.8, emergency stops. E-stop actuators must be spaced no more than five meters apart. General, requ general requirements for e-stops is that it's where people are stood. Um, so that could be a control panel or at the in-feed. Um, but in this part of the standard, it also states no more than five meters. Safety related control uh, systems. So this standard was written before 13.849 and not all parts of it have been harmonized to 13.849 and these parts still refer to EN 954 part one. Non-programmable safety functions must meet at least category one, which now relates to PLC of EN ISO 13.849 part one. Safety functions incorporating drives or servos must achieve at least category three of EN 954, which is now PLD of 13.849. And PLCs and softwares, uh, software used must meet design requirements of IEC 61508. Um, and safety functions must meet SIL 2 of 62061. And that's equivalent to PLD of 13.849. The standard does specify category zero or category one stop, fu stop functions according to EN 60204, but it also mentioned previously that category one stop must be achieved within one second. Two hand control stations must meet type three, the VN 574, which is now uh, 13854. And a type three device is each button must have two normally open and two normally closed contacts that both need to be operated within half a second of each other. This part of the standard is showing the difference in dimensioning of the side of the guard. Um, if a person needs to enter by the front and not the side, why would we need a 500 millimeter gap? Well, at this stage, the goods are not wrapped. So one may drop to the floor or there could be a blockage that needs clearing. 500 millimeters is the minimum uh, gap big enough for somebody to go in and clean the machine and avoid crushing. Um, there are, they are protected by light curtains and the reset is out of reach. The gap at the out feed is 1200, sorry, it's not 1200, is uh, 120 millimeters as they now should not, or, or they should no longer need to enter that way because the goods are now wrapped and secured. The height of the guard should be not less than 2,000 millimetres with a maximum gap at the bottom of 240 millimetres. And the height of the light curtain is not yet specified. However, if we look at the annex, it mentions two scenarios for light curtain uh, placement. If you have a two metre guard at ground level, then three light curtains should be used, positioned at 400, 800 and 1,200 millimetres from the floor and at a minimum reach distance of 900 millimetres, depending on the stopping time, and that's less than 0.4 seconds. Or if you have a two metre guard that extends above a conveyor, then two light curtains should be positioned at least 400 and 900 millimetres above the conveyor, and at a minimum reach distance of 1200 uh, millimetres. Again, depending on the stopping time, in this case, 0.6 seconds. If the stopping time is greater, then you would need to calculate stopping distance using 13855. 415 part seven is group and secondary packing machines. So here we have uh, blister packer, case packer, case packing, tray forming, carting sealer, and they take primary packs and group and pack them into secondary packs in the correct quantities. Section four, hazards relating to these machines. 
were again thermal noise and then specific hazards from tray case erecting, uh, case tapping, etc. So this standard being old mentions that where uh, open top guards are used, they should be at least 1.6 metres from the floor and not 2 metres as, as we saw earlier. So you can use 1.6 as its harmonised standard. The gap for cleaning under, un, uh, under distance, so under the guard, um, should be no greater than 240 millimetres. Section 5 talks about safety requirements, some safety specifics, in particular tunnel guards at the in-feed and out-feed, and the dimensions that should be used. An e-stop should be positioned within 400 millimetres of the guard, and instructions should be uh, provided for gaining access. Section 5 and safeguarding. Similar requirements to 415 Part 6 for whole body access and reset function, while it also mentions automatic detection of persons within the danger area. Uh, and again, uh, it also mentions stopping time for these machines should be less than one second after the opening of an interlock guard. This is not possible, then it should not be possible to open the guard until the hazardous movement has stopped. And again, emergency stops located no more than five metres apart and at each control station, so either category one uh, or zero. Again, this slide, uh, the safety rated controls um, are the same as part six, uh, but I've kept them in there for, for reference. We then have uh, part eight strapping machines. So in this case, we've got a table strapper, uh, an automatic strapper, inline strapper uh, and a pallet strapper. Types of strategy, uh, strapping machines um, are uh, powered hand, uh, semi-automatic, automatic, horizontal, uh, pallet, etc. But not strapping tools that are powered exclusively by manual uh, effort. They're, they're excluded. Specific hazards are listed in section four. Um, and again, um, strapping machines incorporate moving parts, which present a variety of mechanical hazards, including crushing, shearing, cutting, entanglement. Um, you have to then take into account the stored energy in the pneumatics and the hydraulic systems, uh, because these can still be present after the power supply has been cut off. And specifically, if the arms and the head are between the strapping loop and the product, there is also a shearing hazard if the trapped person tries to pull their hand or arm from, uh, from underneath um, due to the sharp edges of the tensioning strap. So again, quite dangerous machines. Part nine is noise measurement. Um, so if there are no noise levels in the specific part of the standard that covers your machine, then you can use part nine for guidance. And part 10 is a complementary standard that kind of mops up any bits that are missing from the other parts. So for example, fixed and interlocked, uh, interlocking movable guards, unless otherwise specified in other parts of VN415, um, open top distance guards shall be at least 2000 millimeters high from the floor or other access platforms. But we saw in 415 part seven that 1.6 meters can be used. And where there is a gap between the guard and the floor, say for cleaning or removing packs, and the gap is greater than 240 millimetres, a guard shall be fitted underneath to prevent access to the hazard uh, points from underneath. And again, earlier we saw that the gap had to be a maximum of 240 millimetres, but we can now make it larger, but would have to fit additional horizontal guards, for example, to prevent access. So to conclude, unless you know what type of packaging machine you have, identify it using part uh, 415 part 1. Use 415 parts 9 and 10 in conjunction with whichever 415 standard applies. 415 parts 2 to 8 will highlight the most common hazards and the safety requirements. However, you must conduct your own risk assessment to EN 12100. 
and many of the 415 standards make reference to withdrawn and out of date standards. And we recommend where replacement standards exist, you must use them. And you can see there's a list of examples here um, going from 953, which is now uh, 14120 for guards, uh, 1088, which is now 14119 for interlocks, uh, 349, which is now 13854 for minimum gaps, uh, EN 999, which is 13855 for approach speeds. So it's worth checking um, throughout the standards where the old ones are and the withdrawn standards are, and then looking at the uh, at replacements. So a bit earlier than uh, than than planned, but uh, that that concludes the webinar um, for today. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Um, I hope that you found it useful. You can find all previously recorded webinars um, that are available to watch at our GoTo Stage channel. Um, you can see the link um, here, which will be in the, in the handouts. And other topics include. Uh, cyber security, um, safeguard locking, um, we have 13849 Pure. The next webinar is Friday the 30th of July and that's understanding 13855 safe distances. And I believe that's been done by my colleague Jamie Thomas. Um, so all that leaves is for me to say thank you um, for your attendance, have a great weekend and we look forward to um, having you at the next webinar. Thank you.